welcome back everyone. So fourth part of the lecture. Um, we will first do the viewer drawing since I promised to do that and I'm gonna draw a puffer fish. Drawing a puffer fish. So let me get the thing straight. So let me get my drawing, get me get a new slide, let you guys show the drawing. So there we are. And of course it is a drawing time. Oh yeah. And time needs to be capitalized. Good. All right. It better be poofy. Yeah, it's going to be poofy. At least I'm going to try. Um, what color do you want to have your puffer fish? Like, what base color? Do you want it to be red? Do you want it to be blue? Which is very hard when you're looking at it in the water, of course, when it's blue. So, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, lick the tip of my pen a little bit so that's good so puffer fish puffer fish so whew, that's a difficult one so at least it's poofy right so I have to go like this but we first do some eyes um, because eyes are very important so let's let's just start with some puffer fish eyes it's right. another one and of course I, I do need to make a nice puffer puffer fish so puffer fish has these puffing lips as well right so let's let's make these nice like big kissable lips on it um yeah i know it's spiky so it, it will be spiky but it, it it's gonna get some nice puffy puffy lips as well because it's a puffer fish <laughs> like a bowling ball with a parrot a parrot beak no nah. Does it have a beak? Does it not have? Okay, let's let's do the beak then. So parrot beak is is easier actually because that's just something like this, right? And then, and then, and then it has a beak. So, all right, that's the first part of the puffer fish, and then of course it needs to be puffy, right? So it needs to be like very, 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 very puffy, right? And then there's this little fish tail at the end, right? And Let's do a tail like this. So, oops, of lots. So that's that's the basis that we're going to start with with the puffer fish, and of course it's a fish, so it has these things, right? And it, it needs a very very small finny here as well, otherwise it's not a puffer fish. Um, so this is going to be a fin, right? And then it needs spikes. So let's give it really nice and angry red red spikes all over the place. So of course we need a lot of red spikes. So that's just going to be something. Can do like this. Another spike here, spike there, spike, spike, spiky. So it's going to be a good drawing. I already, I already see like the high, high quality of it in there, right? Because like it's, it's, it's going to be a good drawing. That's, that's. I feel it. I feel that we are going to get like really nice spiky ones. Best one until now. Well, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. Like, you probably didn't look at my website and, and look at the, 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 the images that I make when there's like a really, really nice, uh, <laughs> when I have the time, right? Like, generally, I take like a couple of hours to do something like this. But, uh, don't forget the sushi rice. All right, because the puffer fish is the thing that actually gives the toxins, right? So, which means actually that it's kind of a biohazard. I'm just going to draw some more spikes on it, right? Because the more spikes, the puffier the fish looks. Um, of course, we have to get some shading in there like later on to, to make sure that it's really nicely shaded. Of course, there's some spikes at the back as well, right? Which do not end up being visible from the front. Um, so let's add some of those. All right. I'm really, really feeling it. I'm happy that I can draw again. I'm happy that I'm getting paid drawing for you guys, actually. I'll <laughs> Trump Why? 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 Do you do you want to have it like a little bit more? Like, um, of course, we we need to give it like nice blue eyes, right? Because otherwise, it's gonna be difficult for the fish to see. And of course, like we had a parrot beak, so let's give it like a orangey kind of kind of beak or orangey kind of mouth. Let's just do it like this, and then we can always use the white again. And of course, we need to have a base color, so mine is going to be green, right? So why not a green puffer fish, right? And then just make a nice green. green. It's always difficult drawing with uh, with having only like a single distance in a pen, but we're going to 
try our best, right? So it's spiky, it's green, it has blue eyes, orange kind of schnabel, or uh, how, we, how you ever want to call it. And we're just going to do it like this. Uh, drawing like my heart out here, so of course this is not a spike, this is the little fin, so then that works as well. And of course we have to do some shading, otherwise it doesn't look 3D that much, but we'll, we'll get to the shading part, so I'll just do a nice, nice shading later on. Alrighty. So let's just continue drawing. Nice green spikes. And let's change the eyes a little bit as well, so that it's more like uh, it fits more to the hole. A little bit of green here. A little bit of like fishy tail, right? Fishy tail also needs to be a little bit green and then of course we need to have some shading so let's start with a little bit darker green color and do some shading which probably is going to be on the underbelly right so slightly darker green here to make sure that it looks a little bit 3D-ish and yeah I'm feeling it I'm feeling it it's gonna kind of kind of be a good one gonna be a good one. This is definitely going to be worth your channel points, uh, Daniel. Like, definitely going to be worth it. And of course we need some shading in the tail as well, because eh, without shading the tail also looks a little bit flattish. Let's just do it like that. And give our nice little puffer fish. And of course we want to use like some black for the eyes to make sure that it's really like looking a little bit aggressive. And of course we need to have something like this. Beautiful puffer fish. It's nothing like I imagined um, at the beginning, but then the spikes are of course red, but also a little bit black in there, which is of course like a little bit dumb when you draw it, but uh, I have to see. I have to see how it looks like. I'm just gonna make a puffer fish, and I don't think that many people are actually interested in the, the stuff that I did for my PhD thesis, so we'll just take a little bit more time to make the puffer fish look really really beautiful right and make sure that Daniel gets his money worth looks like the guinea pig a few weeks ago <laughs> how do you mean it looks like the guinea pig like the guinea pig look completely different like look at the fish tail on this one right this one has really a fish tail um, of course we do want to have like a little bit more shading here just to make sure that it's like a little bit darker on the bottom so that the light comes from above, right? And of course, nice things are always because, like, we can just do like because it's a fish, right? We we want it to swim in water, so we have the water, and then of course, because I think puffer fish they live near these uh, algae, um, how do you call it? These coral reefs, right? So let's make a little nice red-ish color coral reef. Something like that, and then we just do something like that, right? Because the colors, this, uh, like. So never do a live demo. Never do a live demo when you're drawing. But um, it's a little bit more colored color coral, coral, coral reef on the bottom. Uh, let's just use a little bit of orange in there, so just to make sure that there's a little bit of additional colors, so that Daniel gets like a really beautiful colored one, and of course because it's coral it has these like grayish tones as well, um, and it's more like a wall, right, so let's just do something like this, and then there's, of course like other little fishies and stuff live over there, so it has to be a nice place coral reef in the back um, and of course we, we do want to give it some like three-dimensional so let's do something like this and then just have like the sea floor well sea floor shouldn't be blue right sea floor should be uh, like yellowish let's just change that a little bit up so that we have like, the sea floor bottom beautiful beautiful puffer fish swimming in the sea enjoying his life enjoying the lecture as well right since the lecture is over like he's having a good time because he, he made it to the end like you guys did like everyone who's still here made it to the end so you can be proud of yourself that you're still here 
All right, so let's use a little bit of this beautiful yellow in the eyes as well, so just to make sure that they look a little bit more. And then, of course, we bring back a little bit of the bluish, just so that we can see that it's a puffer fish. All right, and of course, we want to get the green little flipper back as well. All right, so let's give it a little white more, so a nice flipper, which is like this. And then, of course, we want to have a little white in the tail, just so that it looks good. All right. So it's starting to look like a puffer fish. I actually have more and different types of pens as well. Um, let me see if there's a nice, like, C color that I can use in the back. Right, like, that looks good, man. Like, look at that beautiful blue changing color. I don't have to do anything with that. So just, like, let it swim here, right? Might have a little fishy or something in the back, or perhaps we should do a little octopus in the back, right? So a little octopus that's hunting the hunting the puffer fish, and let's just do like two eyes, a little octopus, right? So octopus is eight of these things, and they also have like this schnabel thingy. It's just <laughs> that looks like a snowman <laughs> actually, which is uh, but like if we give it a couple of legs, right, it should be fine. It's good that I'm drawing octopus like eyes like this. I, I can't draw an octopus actually, because octopus is more like that, right? So instead of having this roundish thingy on the bottom, it's more like a hunting thing. I don't know. I don't think that the octopus is worth it. I like, can just remove it from the drawing as well. Like, let's just continue on making it nice and blue, um, and then. Uh, that that's probably going to be it for today. I I, I love it. A little bit more background color, so that it's a real drawing. I actually thought about just taking only five minutes and then in five minutes seeing how far I get. But looking at the clock, I need more than five minutes for drawing these things. So uh, I'm just gonna probably put them at the end of the lectures then, or more or less like when the lecture is done and we don't have any slides left, except for like a couple for my thesis. All right, so of course we have C, which walls a little bit. And let's add a little bit of white, a little bit of foam there as well. So that's a little bit of sea foam. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. It's not as good as the, the drawings that I did for the fishy data lecture, though. The fishy data lecture, I spent a lot of time drawing those. Um, so if you want to see the fishy lectures on YouTube, um, where I did a lot of these hand drawings and uh, made sure that it's uh, visible. So of course it needs to look happy, so let's give it a little bit of a happy face. Good. Love it, love it. I'm going to give it some eyebrows as well, because you need some eyebrows, right? Otherwise it's going to be just swimming there without any option for closing its eyelids. Just do that as well. A little eyelid. I like it. Do you like it, Daniel? Are you proud of yourself? Is this worth your channel points, or do you say like, nah, nah? But uh, I think it's not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. Like it's not as good as the, the 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 hamster, right? Because the hamster really looked like a hamster. This is just more like a green blob with some spikes on there, um, but. Still, like, it's hand-drawn, right? Like, I could sell it as an EFT on the market and make a lot of money out of this, I think. Um, that's kind of how things work nowadays, right? You just come up with some weird thing and then just, just sell it as an EFT. Let's do a little bit of a underwater thingy, algae, like, floating as well. Eh, not too bad, not too bad. Good. That's gonna be it. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, so let me sign it, actually. So let me switch to a slightly bigger pen, and then I'm just gonna sign this, and then this is going to be 2021. I like it. I like it. Let me know in the comments. What do you think of it? Good? Not good? Um, I don't know, man. I don't know, man. Like, uh, 
compared to the to the guinea pig, right? How can you say that these things look alike? They do have the kind of same uh same like look in their eyes, but like this one is at least a lot more colorful than the than the previous one. So uh very proud of it. I'm going to pat myself on the back and say you did a good job. Okay. So that's it for the drawing time. Um, Daniel, again, you will get it via email and um, don't sell it all in one place. Well, you will if you make it an EFT, right? Yeah, ETF, so. Good, 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 good. Perfect drawing, perfect drawing. All right. So I told you guys that I did want to talk a little bit about my PhD thesis. So back to some more, like, serious stuff. It's not really serious. Like I, I just like talking about it. So we talked a lot about QTL mapping, right? And that is just the association of a genetic marker with the mean in, in, in different phenotypes, right? So you, you have a marker in the genome where some individuals are one, other individuals are two. Um, and then you look to see, is there a difference in the mean of a certain phenotype? Right, so when I was doing this presentation initially, um, I just had like the definition, right? So a quantitative trait locus is a section of DNA which is associated with variance in a phenotype, a quantitative trait. Right, so that's the definition of a QTL. Right, we already saw this slide, right? So to detect a QTL in a population, um, we need to have measured genotypes, for example, SNPs and a phenotype of interest, such as tail length or yield or whatever you come up with, right? And then at each genetic marker, you just do a regression or a t-test to associate the phenotype with the genetic marker of interest. So again, here we go one by one. Oh, this one goes automatically in doesn't have the little thing, right? So we go through the markers and in each marker we just say, well, okay, is the A group bigger or smaller than the B group? Um, so that's kind of what QTL mapping is. We do statistics to associate the marker and we show it as a lot score. We already talked about that. And then hand likelihoods are plotted for every marker on the chromosome. We already saw this. And in, in RQTL, I also showed you how to load the library. So we load the library, we load the data set. And in, in RQTL, you have to scan one function to do a QTL scan if you don't want to do the t-test yourself or if you don't want to do the other tests, right? And then you get, uh, you call the plot function and then the plot function generates this. So there are some serious limitations in QTL mapping, right? One of the things that when I started my PhD really was difficult for me to deal with is that QTL mapping only considers a single phenotype at a time, right? So we're only looking at yield or flowering time or some other phenotype which we associate. And it requires the phenotype to show significant differences, right? If we want to QTL map, um, the locus on the genome which controls the tail in mice we can do that for tail length right because every mouse has a slightly different length of tail but every mouse has a tail so we'll never be able to find the gene which controls if you have a tail or if you don't have a tail because every mouse has a tail. The same thing holds for eyes, right? Everyone has two eyes. So doing a QTL mapping for, for the number of eyes, well, not so much the number of eyes because that might vary. Um, well, not based on heritability, of course, but um, so had the, the, the phenotype needs to show significant differences. And the problem is, is that a lot of the phenotypes which are really, really interesting do not show any difference, right? Um, every human has hair. So figuring out where the locus is that controls hair or no hair is of course very hard to determine. And one of the other big drawbacks in QTL mapping, and we didn't talk about this before, is that when you have two phenotypes which are very correlated to each other, like um, the length of your arm versus the length of yourself, um, then they result into very similar QTL profiles because the phenotype vectors are highly correlated to each other um, yeah, because the longer you are, the longer your arms are, um, the load side that it will come up with are very similar. And of course, that, that, that is genetically or like biologically that makes sense. Um, but for some things, this is really annoying, right? Because generally we, we're interested in like um, 
where differences are controlled for and we also want to know for example where in the genome do we find the gene that controls if you have a tail or not. Um, so hey, one phenotype at a time there needs to be significant differences and highly correlated phenotypes result in a very similar similar QTL profile which just means that you cannot distinguish loci that make you grow bigger from loci which make your arm grow longer. Um, so that's just a drawback. So imagine two phenotypes which are very highly linked. Right? So imagine that I am a plant biologist or I am a farmer and I am growing corn. Right? And I'm very interested in the yield of my corn, so the amount of grain that I get from a single plant um, and the susceptibility to infection. Then these two things are highly correlated to each other because bigger yields generally mean a higher susceptibility to infection. And this is something that we have seen in many, many phenotypes. Um, and here's one of these examples where we, uh, where people looked at wheat yields, so the yields of wheat plants um, across the years. Right, so you see here that well, initially there was no real like um, improvement, right? Because we just did race selection and then we did pedigree selection to kind of improve our plants. Um, but when we started, like in 1955, using scientific breeding and especially in the 1980s with the advent of QTL mapping, people figured out which locations on the genome of this plant controlled the yield. And we've been doing this now for like. 20 years and the yields are decreasing right you see that in the beginning when we started QTL mapping we had a very high or very rapid improvement in the amount of food that we could make out of a square acre of a field um, but this has been more or less stabilizing since like 2000 2005 so we found the initial load side that were controlling the phenotype um, we selected the animals for having positive load size but in the end, we, we, we selected this a couple of times and now we're in a situation where our plants are more or less optimal and there's this kind of improving plant yield further also makes them more susceptible, which makes that the yield goes down again. And this is, it, this is a very serious problem in science and in production as well, right? Because the way that we as humans live on this planet is that every year we need more resources because there's more humans. So we want this increase that we get from the scientific breeding approach or more or less the selection approach using QTL mapping and these kinds of things to continue improving. But we can't because the more we improve our plants, the more susceptible they become, the less yield we get in the end. Right? So at the beginning of my PhD, I thought long and hard about this and I said that no, we should find a different method, right? Because we are interested in these two things at the same time, the susceptibility on the one hand and the yield on the other hand. And these two things are coupled together. So we want to, instead of map the differences in mean, we would want to map where this correlation is breaking, right? Because if we find a genetic locus where the correlation breaks, then we can actually select for this locus and then we can continue improving without suffering the, the, the effect from the susceptibility. So that's why I define CTL mapping as a correlated trait locus, CTL, which is very poorly chosen in retrospect because CTL also stands for cytotoxic T cell. And there's a lot of literature about cytotoxic T cells. Um, and their literature amount is improving. So no one can find my method. So everyone who searched for CTL mapping on Google gets like genome wide associations where people use cytotoxic toxic C cells. So it's very poorly chosen. But eh, a correlated trait locus is a section of the DNA. So a locus in the DNA, which is associated with differences in correlation between phenotypes. So CTL mapping is very similar to QTL mapping. It's just the difference is, is that it's multi phenotype. So instead of looking at a single phenotype at a time, we're looking at pairs of phenotypes. And what we want to do is we want to identify genetic regions where there's a difference in the phenotype to phenotype correlation, conditional on the genetic marker that we're currently looking at. And of course, 
it's an unbiased data-driven method which no prior information so there's no type of bias that flows into it right the same thing as QTL mapping we just measure the genotypes we measure the phenotypes and then we do the association analysis and CTL mapping is similar in that sense so there's no like iterative process or these kinds of things involved so the idea that I when I came up with the idea is what that, that CTL mapping should be applied in classical selection in breeding to improve the economically interesting phenotypes. So the, the idea was that you select for a beneficial CTL locus similar to QTL. So in the case of yield and susceptibility, you want to break them, right? So you don't, you want a locus at which these two phenotypes are not showing any correlation. Because if they are showing correlation and you're selecting for it, then the next generation will still show correlation, right? And the idea is, is that by selecting for these beneficial loci where the correlation breaks, you can, you can break the linkage, so the correlation between these phenotypes in the next generation. When we started doing this, we also figured out that when we combine correlated trait loci together with quantitative trait load so we can build kind of a phenotype by phenotype causal network um, and I'm not going to talk much about that but I want to talk about this initial idea that by trying to find load psi at which two phenotypes which are normally highly correlated are now not showing any correlation and then selecting for that locus will be able to break this this linkage um, so that's the thing Right, so the yield plateau tells us that both phenotypes, yield and susceptibility, because they are highly correlated with each other, you will get the exact same QTL profile. Right, so when you select for high yield, you will also select for increasing susceptibility, which you don't want, because that means that you have to use more and more chemicals to get rid of all of the bugs every time. So the idea is that CTL mapping finds load side where correlation between yield and susceptibility is lost. We can then use the CTL information to break the correlation between yield and susceptibility. So how does this look? So had this was one of my figures from my thesis where I just said, well, had this is a simulation. And so um, if we have phenotype A, which is the yield of the plant, we have phenotype B, uh, which is the susceptibility. Um, we have the AA genotypes, which show strong correlation, right? The same correlation that we see overall in the population. Um, and we have here the BB genotype, which shows low to no correlation, which you can see that there's no like it's just a cloud of points and there's no straight line, right? So if you see a picture like this, which genotype should we breed? Should we breed the AA individuals or should we breed the BB individuals? So that's a question to you guys in chat, if you're still listening, right? So that, that was the whole idea behind it, right? That if you have two phenotypes, which are highly correlated overall, at each marker, you look at the correlation uh, between the individuals which are AA and the individuals which are BB, and then you will find, if you're lucky, a locus in the genome where these two highly correlated phenotypes are not correlated. So in this case, of course, if you want to breed the next generation, you want to breed individuals which are BB at this locus. Right? because the BB shows no correlation. And in this case, we have a, a positive phenotype linked with a negative phenotype. And we can also have like a negative phenotype linked with a, a negative one. Um, and then of course, you would probably want to have the correlation and show the lower tail. Right, so select the CTL genotype to unlink two phenotypes then in the next generation, which should show a decrease of correlation between the phenotypes. And this allows again in the next generation to select high yield without increasing the susceptibility, right? And then in, in the next generation, you would just select individuals based on QTL information like you would normally do. So the methodology um, here, I explain it using recombinant inbred lines. There is a package on uh, CRAN, which actually is called CTL. Um, and this package handles many more complex crosses. So I, I just explain it here using AA and BB individuals. But it also works if you have an F2 population where you have AA, AB and BB individuals. So uh, recombinant inbred lines, um, I'm, I'm had the example here is assuming that I have four phenotypes which have been measured and I have six genetic markers, 
right? So I have four different phenotypes and six genetic markers. And um, uh, at, at, at every locus, right, at every marker there, an individual can have either AA or BB, just to simplify it for the, for the presentation. So the way that this methodology works is first you select a phenotype called P1, right? So that's your first phenotype. Then you select a genetic marker, so the first one, right? You split the individuals into two groups by their genotype. So you have a group of individuals at the first, which at the first marker is AA, and then you have a group of individuals which at the first marker is BB. So hey, you have a population, for example, of 100 animals, and 50 of them go into group 1, 50 of them are in group 2, because these 50 have AA, these 50 have BB. Then what you do is you calculate your correlation for both the AA and the BB genotype. What you do is you do P1 times all of the phenotype correlation vector, right? So you just say, well, calculate the correlation of your phenotype P1 with the phenotypes which are showing AA, right? And then you just get a vector. So phenotype 1, of course, shows a correlation of 1 to phenotype 1, because two things which are equal always have a correlation of 1. Um, P1 and P2 at, at this marker show 0 0.1 uh, correlation, um, P1 and P3 0 0.5, P4 0 0.8, right? So here P1 and P4 are highly correlated at this marker. You do the same thing for the BB individuals, right? So you again get a vector with four correlation coefficients. Um, of course, P1 versus P1 is still one. Um, and for the other three phenotypes, you also get a correlation. So correlation in, in, pop, in the AA individuals, correlation in the BB individuals. So then the next step is just to define the effect size, right? So the effect size in, in QTL is defined as the difference in the mean between the AA group and the BB group. But in, in CTL mapping, the CTL defect size is calculated or defined as the difference in correlation between the AA and the BB groups, right? Just like QTL, but now instead of looking at the difference in mean, we're looking at the difference in correlation between phenotype, right? And to make it easy, we're just going to take the absolute difference, right? So not negative and positive, we're just going to say that um, like the, 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 the absolute difference, right? So minus 0 0.1 becomes 0 0.1. So when we do that, yeah, so here we have the two vectors from before, and now we just calculate the difference vector. So of course, P1, yeah, because the correlation in of P1 to P1 is of course 1 and 1, the difference is 0. The difference from P1 in AA to P1 to P2 and BB um, is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.7, right? So we just take the difference, so we just subtract these two vectors from each other. Then the next step, of course, is now we have mapped one marker is to do all of the markers, right? So what I do is I take the vector that I just had and just put it on its side, right? So now here we have the markers in the, in the columns and we have the different phenotypes in the rows. Right, so this is the result from the last slide. You can check that it's 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.7. And indeed here you see the same thing, right? And then this is the difference vector for matrix two, difference vector for marker three, difference vector for marker four, and so on. And like I told you, we assume that we only have six. Right, so I repeat this calculation for every genetic marker, so multiple difference vector for our selected phenotype. Of course, that when we map P1 against P1, it will always yield a difference of zero, right? So we could have not mapped this and just skipped it, but just for completeness sake, I just want to show you the whole, um, whole matrix. Let me get a sip of water. It's been a, sorry, it's been a long lecture. All right, so here we map P1 against P1, always is zero. And of course, for the other phenotypes, we don't get that. So now we need to, of course, find what is significant, right? Is this difference of 0 0.6 in correlation, is that a significant difference? So what we do is we repeat the same thing 10,000 times, just like I showed you guys for QTL, hey, is we break the link between genotype and phenotype, right? So in this case, we're just assigning genotype vectors at random to the individuals, just like we did before in QTL mapping. But in QTL mapping, we assigned the phenotypes randomly 
right? But now since we have two phenotypes, we want an individual, so the two phenotypes of the individual to stay the same, but now we just give it a random genotype vector in the end. Right, so we redo the whole analysis, we remember the maximum score, and then we make a distribution out of it, and then we find our 5% and 1% thresholds for significance values, right? It's just the same way. So we're just going to permute ourselves out of problems um, by just saying, I'm just going to, instead of assigning a new phenotypic value for each individual based on the act that we have, we're now just going to assign like a new genotype. So. CTL uses 10,000 plus permutations to assign significant. Of course, in the package, because I did study this stuff for four years, I also devised a method to directly calculate your p-value using mathematics. So, of course, here we, we then convert, so we convert the differences in correlation that we see to probability values. So how likely is it that there is a real correlation difference at that point? And then we do the next step, which is just saying the same as QTL, where we convert the p-value to the lot score. So we just take the minus log 10 of the p-value. So by converting this, have we perform QTL mapping for uh, p1 as well? So and because we, we have the data anyway, so we have p1, which we can CTL map against the four phenotypes that we have, but we can of course also just do the QTL mapping, right? So for P1, we get four vectors of lot scores from CTL mapping, right? So every 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 correlation difference is transformed into a lot score, um, and beside that, we have the information about P1 itself, right? So because we can also associate P1 with every one of the six markers that we have. So how does this then look? So this is the way that we visualize it. So we take our QTL curve of P1 and we just plot it on the top. And then we take the CTL curves of P1 versus the other phenotypes, which we see on the bottom. Right, so on the bottom is the lot score, um, the negative lot score of the CTL score. And of course, the, on the bottom, we then see four or five or six or seven lines, um, no matter or, or how many phenotypes we had. All right, so that was the CTL mapping method. It's a relatively easy thing, right? And in the end, we find loci in the genome where we see that there's, for example, a QTL controlling the variation in P1, but we also see that at this locus, P1 loses correlation with some of the other phenotypes. Um, let me actually pull up one of the other presentations that I did about CTL mapping where we use some real data, right? Um, just to show you guys how we can use this information. Um, it should be somewhere in presentations. CTC, transmission ratio distortion. Ah, yeah, here. So let me open this up and... All right. Um, can I actually easily swap that? Just swap the PowerPoint. Yes, I can. So let's go to properties and then switch to this one, right? So what we were looking at here is in Arbidopsis thaliana, we have metabolites and these metabolites are known to be in a linear pathway. So we have a f something called hydroxypropyl which is then using an enzyme is transformed into methyl sulfonylpropyl and then using another enzyme, this is transformed into methyl theopropyl, right? So it's just three metabolites with two enzymes in the middle. There is a major regulator of this pathway on chromosome five, and all of this was known, right? So then I did the CTL mapping, right? So the first plot that I'm going to show you is, and remember the colors, right? So it's, it's green, red, orange, right? So green is on the top of the network, then green gets transformed into red and red gets transformed into to orange. So here we see this, the QTL profile of hydroxypropyl on the top, right? So we see that there's a major regulator of the difference in hydroxypropyl on chromosome 5. The same thing holds for chromosome 4. There's a, a marker on chromosome 4 which also um, controls the hydroxypropyl concentration in, in the plant. But then we start seeing that if we do the CTL mapping with methyl sulfonylpropyl and methyl theopropyl, right, so the red one and the orange one, we see that we do find a little locus on chromosome one. 
And that is strange, right? Because we never had any indication from QTL mapping that something on chromosome one was actually driving the hydroxypropyl region. But we do get the idea that, well, there is something on one which makes, which, which makes hydroxypropyl lose its regulation or, or lose its correlation with the other two phenotypes that we're looking at. And we see the same thing on chromosome 5, right? So on chromosome 5 we learn nothing new because we already knew that there was a major driver of this network. When we then look at the middle phenotype in the pathway, um, of, uh, the middle metabolite in the pathway, methyl sulfonylpropyl, what we see is now, hey, that's interesting. There is a little QTL on chromosome 1 for the middle phenotype. So there is something on chromosome 1 which is controlling the concentration of the, the middle phenotype. Of course there's also something on chromosome 5 um, which is kind of passed down right from the initial one. So the, the initial concentration of hydroxypropyl is transformed into methyl sulfonylpropyl. Right, so the more you have at the beginning, of course, the more you have from the intermediate product as well. So here we also see the um, the CTL line, and we did indeed see that that at this locus we do get the idea that yes, no, that there is correlation between the amounts of sulfonylpropyl of a uh, hydroxypropyl, sulfonylpropyl, and the thiopropyl. So when we then look at thiopropyl, now we see something interesting. Because if we look at the top, we see that when we do the QTL mapping of this phenotype, we don't know where the concentration of this, this, this um, metabolite is controlled from. There are no significant regions. So if I would do an experiment using methyl thiopropyl uh, measurements, right, and I would scan across the genome, I would learn that there is no locus that is controlling the concentration of methyl thiopropyl. However, if we look at the CTL map, we do see that we get significant load sign. So we do see that the, the, the method tells us there is something on chromosome 5 which is influencing the correlation of thiopropyl, hydroxypropyl, and methyl, uh, methyl sulfonylpropyl. Right? And the same thing again on chromosome 1. So what we see is that for the first two phenotypes, we don't really learn anything new, except for that there is something going on on chromosome 1 for hydroxypropyl. We learn for the middle one, we don't learn anything, or not that much, because we already knew that there was something on chromosome 5 controlling it. But for the last one, we don't get any QTL. And because we get no QTL, as a geneticist, you're stuck here. You cannot say what's happening to thiopropyl. But we can, from, QT, uh, from CTL mapping, we learn that no, there, you, if you want to influence this phenotype, you have to be on chromosome 5. And there might be something on chromosome 1 which can also influence it. So the idea is, is that we have this network, right? So this network is driven, so if we combine the QTL information that we get, so on chromosome 5, we see that the strongest association with chromosome 5 is with hydroxypropyl then the, the, the lot score, then because this the concentration of this one influences the concentration of this one. So we can still see the effect of the chromosome 5 locus on this one. But we learn that this effect of chromosome 5 is not a direct effect. It is an indirect effect. It goes via hydroxy. So the thing on chromosome 5 is not directly influencing methyl sulfonylpropyl, it is influencing hydroxypropyl, and that in turn is influencing methyl sulfonylpropyl. So the exact same thing have we then find for this locus here. We don't find any direct association of chromosome 5 with this phenotype, but based on the CTL and the strength of the CTL, right, because the thickness of the line de determines the strength, we now learn and we now start seeing that indeed this is kind of a linear network, right, because we see that the red uh, metabolite should be in between the two because there is a very strong CTL from the red one, to, uh, from the green one to the red one, but from the green one to the yellow one, it is much lower. And from the red one to the yellow one, it's also lower, but it's still detectable, right? So we can start building up this causal network and seeing that indeed eh, the network should be hydroxypropyl causes changes in sulfonylpropyl, which then causes changes in methyl thiopropyl. And without CTL mapping, we would have never 
looked at chromosome 5 for this phenotype because there is no direct association um, only based on the correlation can you see that the correlation is lost at that point good so that's the whole big idea that's what people gave me my doctor title for seems not much but was a lot of work was a lot of work to uh to to do all of this and uh thank you guys for uh actually staying until the end right so um you can see that i actually use the same phenotype in this presentation as well um but the the idea is is that qtl mapping is only a part of the puzzle qtl mapping gives you direct effects on the means of phenotype but in the end it's not about single phenotypes it's about the relationship between phenotypes and how genetic loci kind of modify these relationships good so that was what i wanted to tell you today so for today just as a quick overview we did phenotypes heritability i tried to explain to you guys what qtl mapping is and how you need to use experimental crosses i told you guys about gwas i didn't tell you about the bfmi it will be in the slides that i upload but i, I just skipped that part um, and i will talk to you i, I talked to you about ctl mapping also the fine mapping part is not directly in the in the presentation because I, I skipped it today because we were kind of running out of time because we took an hour for the assignments all right so for me that's it for today if there's any questions remarks other things um, then then please let me know I'll throw it in the chat I think all of the four guys that made it to the end like you're amazing um, thank you for being here and of course for my moderator who's also probably still here um, Bacon, Misha, thank you guys for joining and staying until the end. Um, that was it for me. It's uh, five, so people on YouTube, um, see you on the flip side. So, see you next time.